it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, my friend, my colleague, Dr. Roger Milbrandt. Thank you very much, Ellen. Honored and distinguished guests, faculty, friends and kin of the graduates, and those of you who are about to graduate. When I was an eager-hearted high school student, I fantasized about being the first member of my family and the first person in White Mouth, Manitoba to obtain a university degree. My mother, who always nourished my fantasy, told me one day about a radio interview with a man who said that his education began after he received his university degree. To my mother, with her grade eight education, and to me, this was shocking and almost unbelievable. We thought that once you obtained a university degree, you knew almost everything there is to know. <laughs> I expect none of you hold the delusion that my mother and I used to hold. But I am, by necessity, committed to an even more stupendous delusion. And that is that in the next 15 minutes or so, I will somehow bring your education to its completion. <laughs> Someone once said, be realistic, attempt the impossible. If you listen closely, you will learn who said this. And in the meantime, I will be realistic. This is my last lecture as an Augustana faculty member. And for you who have suffered 1,500 or so such events in the past four years, the last you will be called upon to receive. It would make little sense for me to try to summarize what you have learned in four years of study. And it would be pointless for me to convey to you the many brilliant and unforgettable things that my colleagues and I forgot to mention. <laughs> but what if I were to tell you not what we already told you, not what we forgot to mention. What if I were to tell you what we dared not tell you? Because that, in my case, is a large category. Those of you who have taken courses from me, and perhaps this includes Verlin Olson, may remember that when I approach a literary work that has a political dimension, I invariably ask the class, how many of you are interested in political questions? Usually two or three timid hands arise while everyone maintains an embarrassed silence. And I generally respond in a lighthearted and evasive way sometimes admitting that the current crop of politicians does not inspire me very much either. <laughs> that did not convey what I really thought and felt. And today I want to tell you what I dared not say on those occasions. First, let me note that when my colleagues and I lament the general indifference of university students to political issues, we usually recall that when we were university students, we were no different. We also notice that you have a great many matters which occupy your time. You work harder on your courses than we did. You are entitled to a private life and to recreation. It is not surprising that you do not take time to acquaint yourselves with political issues. In short, we generally let you off the hook. Well, my friends, today, I want to reinvent the hook. <laughs> Aristotle said long ago that we are political animals. He did not mean by this that we secretly long to be the Premier of Alberta or the Minister of Agriculture. <laughs> he meant that we all belong to communities which have rules and power structures. We are members of families. 
Families combine to form villages, and villages combine to form the city-state or the polis, the largest entity to which Aristotle gave attention. We find our fulfillment and discover our identity, according to Aristotle, not through private contemplation, but through our relationship with the groups to which we belong, family, village, polis. Times have changed. The population of the world is now much greater. The nation states into which our world is organized are much larger than the city states with which Aristotle was familiar. Furthermore, developments in transportation and communication mean the city states must now form relationships with one another, either competitive or cooperative. The Cuban sage Jose Marti said more than a century ago, my nation is humanity. Many people feel that this is not just a sublime ideal, but to a certain extent, a statement of fact for all of us. We are still political animals, but the polis, which for Aristotle was the city-state, is for us the world. When we look at the world and at humanity in general, we see a large mass of mostly impoverished people leading precarious lives, constantly threatened by war, economic collapse, and environmental catastrophe. A relatively small proportion of struggling humanity, about one-seventh, live in what we like to call the first world. We rejoice here that not all of you are Canadians. Two of you who are graduating are from Hong Kong and one from Nigeria. Still, the great majority of you who are Canadians live in one of the most secure nations in the first world. Those of you who are from Alberta occupy one of the most prosperous parts of Canada. The advantages of security and prosperity that we enjoy are not a result of our individual virtue, nor are they a reward for our exceptional merit. Rather, they are a result of such things as constitutions, trade and investment treaties, military alliances, and immigration policies. All of these are political processes and political arrangements. I often wonder whether we in the first world have even the right to enjoy the immense advantages that the current arrangement of political power gives to us. But I never wonder, because I am absolutely convinced that we do not have the moral right to ignore the political basis of that vastly unequal distribution of the goods of the world. That is the most important of the many things that I dared not say. The same Aristotle who told us that we are political animals was perceptive enough to notice as well that we are sexual creatures. And let this bring my thought to its completion. If you are not interested in sex, that does not make you more virtuous than the rest of us. It makes you other than human. I did not on this occasion ask you to put up your hands. <laughs> Similarly, to be uninterested in political questions is not an elevation of your humanity, it is a contraction. Having, I hope, reinvented the hook, I now want to sharpen the point. What I have just said, I could say to any group of first world adults. But you are a particular group of first world adults, graduates of a liberal arts and science institution. And upon you, I will place some additional pressure. In all of your courses, in all of your disciplines, you have gained some experience in finding things out and in then communicating what you have discovered. The grand terms used for these activities in universities 
our research and publication. Through research, we discover things. Through publication, we make our discoveries public. It is likely that even before you came to Augustana, you already had an above average capability for discovery and communication. But you have enjoyed the great privilege of being able to spend four years meditating upon questions that confront us as human beings, at sharpening your natural abilities for examining the world in its various aspects, and at articulating your observations and surmises. These abilities are very precious. Augustana has a justified confidence in the future of our graduates. This is based partly on empirical evidence and statistics. And it is based also on something more profound than either of these. We know that no matter how the world changes, no matter how dramatically future technological developments alter the conditions of our lives, the ability to draw reasonable conclusions on the basis of a judicious collection and examination of evidence, and to then communicate these conclusions, we know that these abilities will never be obsolete, and that no matter how far you travel, you will not find a spot on the globe where those abilities are irrelevant. But this also imposes upon you a moral obligation. You may blush when I refer to you as leaders in the formation of public opinion. But the fact is that although people might sneer at educated people, calling them eggheads who know more and more about less and less, the fact remains that education is valued and respected. All of you, in at least a modest way, will influence the way others think. And it is possible, even likely, that some of you will someday exert a substantial influence. If people in general do not have a moral right to be indifferent to political questions, then those of you with a liberal education have, in my judgment, an additional responsibility. And that is the responsibility to be informed. Whatsoever things are true is an excellent motto, both for a university and for a citizen. If you take an interest in political issues, as I have advised, and if you become well informed, you will certainly develop political opinions and will likely develop what might be called a political philosophy or a political ideology. Some of you are probably thinking that it would be logical for me at this point to now tell you what political ideology you should adopt. <laughs> Others of you, especially my left-wing friends, are likely saying to yourselves, I hope to God he's not crazy enough to present them with a political ideology. <laughs> Here is what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you a story. And it is a story mostly about left-wing people. But I tell this story very confidently because I expect that my right-wing friends having heard this story, will say, I don't like the politics of this story, but it is a heck of a story, and we can learn something from it. <laughs> we shall see. I should note that it is a very simple story, but perhaps I have been influenced by years of re reading your final examinations, and I will pad the story heavily. What goes around comes around. <laughs> those of you who have been in my office and those of you who have been in my home may have noticed that you no, do not travel very far in premises that I occupy without finding a portrait of Che Guevara. Che Guevara, as many of you know, 
was an, was an Argentinian physician. He is famous for his central participation as a guerrilla leader in the Cuban Revolution, which came to power in January of 1959. Later, after being part of the Cuban government for a few years, Guevara went on to pursue other revolutions, first in what was then called the Congo, and later in Bolivia, where he was captured and killed in 1967. Here are a couple of things about Guevara which are not generally known. His first serious girlfriend was a Peruvian woman named Ilda Gadea. She said that as she got to know Che, she was astounded that so attractive a person could also be so widely read and so deep a thinker without ever having gone to Augustana. <laughs> she didn't say that last part. <laughs> she said she was, an ama she was amazed that so attractive a person could be so widely read and so deeply thought. The French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre met Guevara in the early 60s and pronounced him the most complete human being of his time. I've always had an idea that I know why Sartre made that bold pronouncement. Che was a genuine intellectual, widely read and deeply thought, as I mentioned, but also a fine writer. However, unlike most intellectuals, Che was absolutely committed to carrying his ideals into practice at whatever cost. Even the ultimate cost of his life, which he paid. Guevara studied medicine at the University of Buenos Aires, anticipating a career in medical research. But he took a year off from his studies to treat himself to an adventure a motorcycle tour of Latin America. As he toured Latin America with a friend who was also a medical student, he observed the impoverished masses there. And it occurred to him, for he was from a rich family, that no medical discovery would ever benefit the unfortunate impoverished of Latin America because they could not afford the cost of medical services. As a physician, Interested in the health of his people, Guevara concluded that his moral obligation was to work for a social revolution that would so transform the distribution of political power and wealth as to bring medical attention within the reach of the poor as well as the rich. Guevara knew that he would be immortalized for his role in the Cuban Revolution. He also knew that if he continued his revolutionary trajectory, he would die a tragic death at an early age. But here is something that hardly anyone knows. The Bolivian soldier who was ordered to execute Guevara and did so is still alive. Until recently, he suffered from cataracts that were so severe he could hardly see. He and his family did not have enough money to defray the prohibitive cost of cataract surgery. But the surgery was performed and performed successfully by a surgeon from Cuba. The surgeon was part of a program called Operation Miracle, jointly sponsored by Venezuela and Cuba, a program that has carried out successful cataract surgery for more than a million and a half impoverished Latin Americans who could not otherwise have had access to that procedure. Operation Miracle is itself a part of a much larger enterprise called Cuban Medical Internationalism, one result of which is that Cuba, with a population of 11 million people, provides medical care for about 60 million people in Africa and Latin America. No one but no one has been so an impo important an inspiration for Cuban medical internationalism as Che Guevara. It is not an exaggeration to say that the Bolivian soldier who killed Che Guevara owes his restored vision to a program largely inspired by Che Guevara. To apply his own words to him, Che was realistic. He attempted the impossible, and it was carried out. 
There are two additional details, both very quiet but very eloquent, which I feel I must mention. The son of the Bolivian soldier who surely must have known how Cubans would have felt about his father and perhaps even about him, sent a special note to the Cuban government thanking them for the service they had performed for his father. That, it seems to me, is a courageously generous action. One final detail. The identity of the Cuban surgeon who performed the surgery has never been made known. This, I think, is as it should be. For the real hero of this story is not the individual surgeon, but all the thousands of nurses, medical technicians, doctors, and medical administrators who are part of this extraordinary program. A journalist I much admire, a man named Andrei Volchuk, who is a Russian-Chinese Czech with a US citizenship who lives in Indonesia, Volchuk refuses to call Cuban physicians, whom he greatly admires, he refuses to call Cuban physicians Cubans and calls them instead internationalists. He does this not out of disrespect for Cuba, but because he believes that the highest achievement of any country is to produce not great Canadians, not great Chinese, not great Nigerians, and not great Cubans, but great internationalists, people who will say, along with Jose Marti, my nation is humanity. I told this story for many reasons, and one is that it enables me to undertake a little thought experiment. I want you to imagine what would have happened if the Bolivian soldier had been put on trial for Che Guevara. Knowing how such trials proceed, I think it is almost inevitable that at some point in the trial he would have defended himself by saying, I was just following orders. I have known many Cuban physicians in my life, and the most remarkable characteristic they share is modesty. Therefore, I strongly suspect that if the Cuban surgeon who removed that soldier's cataracts were enthusiastically congratulated for what she or he did, the response would have been, I was just doing my job. There is an important difference between obeying orders and doing your job. When you obey, obey orders, you submit to an authority which is external and always somewhat arbitrary. When you do your job, you are doing what your community has enabled you to do well and what, in doing well, serves the community. I hope that in your futures, you will be able to spend much more time doing your job than at obeying orders. And that if you need to make a choice between obeying orders and doing a job, your attachment to your community will overpower your anxiety about authority. I am under orders to stop talking soon. <laughs> but I will do my job <laughs> to the extent of expressing one final thought. Augustanet's first Cuba program was held at a university in Havana named Enrique Verona. Enrique Verona was a Cuban educator of the early 20th century. About 90 years ago, Verona said something, which I think is more poignantly true for our time than it was for his. Verona said, as long as there are teachers who love their work, humanity will always have a future. My friends, I have loved my work for 40 years, and really never so much as in the last 20 minutes. <laughs> I have spoken to you this afternoon from my depths. If I have spoken clearly, if you have listened carefully, and if you ponder what you heard, and if Verona proves to have been right, 
then humanity has a future. May all of you long play a brilliant role in that future. Thank you very much.